Okay, folks, uh, this is Douglas Pinkham with Pinkham & Associates, uh, dedicated, we are a dedicated family law firm here in Orange County, California, but I am helping people figure out how to fill out these forms, and you can fill out these forms anywhere within the state of California, same forms. Okay, this form is the FL160, FL160, it is the property declaration. Um, okay, so... This form can be used for several different um, things. You can use it uh, in your declarations of disclosure you, to describe uh, the property and the values and maybe even who, who, you, who, who is going to get them. Um, and you can use it as part of a judgment to show how you're asking the court to divide your property. This is a really handy form. I don't use it very often because it's sort of a secondary form, but you can use it for those purposes. Now, <clears throat> uh, just like every form, uh, I'm going to start now. Uh, and by the way, if you don't see the form on the video already, you can hit a link below and print out the form because I want you to have this form in front of you while we go over it. Okay, very good. Um, all right, starting at the top, just like every form, you're going to put your name, uh, your address, uh, and telephone, um, and telephone, you can put a fax number in there, you don't need to put a fax number in there, um, and you can put your email address in there, you don't need to put your email address in there, <clears throat> and then attorney for, just like all the forms, if you're doing the forms for yourself, you're going to put your name in there, here I've got a uh, client's name, John Doe, so John Doe's filling this out. Uh, Superior Court County of, so you're going to put in there the county in which you're filing your paperwork. All right, then the next uh, lines are the address of that court. So if you don't know the address of the court, Google it, look it up, put the court address in there. Really got to fix this. Really got to fix this misspelling of orange. Okay. Then it asks for the branch name. Um, your court is likely to have its own branch name. Could be East Court, South Court. In Orange County, it's called the Lamro Justice Center. Los Angeles has a central court on 111 North Hill Street. Um, so there's a bunch of different addresses or names. Um, it may or may not have a, its own name, but if you can find the name, then I would put that in there. The next line asks for the petitioner's name and the respondent's name. Keep in mind, those never change. So whoever was the petitioner in the beginning of the case is still the petitioner, will always be the petitioner on all forms. Whoever was the respondent in the beginning of the case is the respondent now and will always be the respondent. Okay, next line. Um, you're not going to put anything under other parent or party. <laughs> Um, unless there, unless there is somebody else um, that has been joined into the case, and if that's true, you will know that. Um, <clears throat> all right. So then the next uh, line asks to mark either the petitioner or the respondent. So if you're the petitioner, mark petitioner. If you're the respondent, mark the respondent. Okay. Now, this form is asking you, this next line is asking you, are we going to, are you going to list here the community and quasi-community property? Um, or are you going to list the separate property? So you can use this form to do several different things. If you want to use it twice and mark community and quasi-community property uh, declaration, then you can mark that and then below put all the community property assets. Then you can fill out a second one and put and mark separate property, and you can mark all the separate property uh, items. For a judgment, uh, it's you really need to just divide um, uh, the community property assets. Um, uh, so that's what we're going to mark. By the way, it says quasi uh, community or quasi community property. Quasi community property is just property that you own outside the state of California that if it were within the borders of the state of California would be community property. So if you own a property in 
Um, you know, if you own a, a ski lodge in Colorado uh, that you bought during the marriage, that's quasi community property, it would be listed in here also and divided the same as uh, a piece of rental property that you own in San Francisco. All right, so let's move on. Next line down, we start moving into the form itself. Um, okay, and you will notice that this will follow along the same, <coughs> excuse me, the same approximate titles of the, of the different sections on the schedule of assets and debts too. Um, but you can use this form instead of that uh, in place of that. So um, I like this form and you'll see this. I like this form because off to the right, you can put the value, the fair market value of the property, but not only that, you can put that fair market value into either the petitioner or the respondent's column. I'm going to give you an example of this real shortly. Um, okay, so let's say, let's get started. So under number one, real estate, let's say you own a piece of property at 123 Main Street, um, uh, Orange, California. All right, uh, let's say you acquired that uh, during the marriage, but let's say that was in March of 2016. Then you're put that there. And then let's say the gross fair market value today, and you can ask around or you can Zillow it, which are horrible, you know, Redfin, any of those online valuation um, websites. Uh, they'll give you a value, all right, um, but we have found through our research that sometimes they're significantly wrong. But if you need to get a value and you have no other value, you could use that value, or you could ask some real estate agents in town, or you can look down the street and find out what your neighbor is selling your model house for. Okay, but let's say you know that the value of your house is 825000 All right, and then we'll go to the next one, and let's say, for example... There's, you know that there's $456,000 of debt on the house. Uh, I'm going to say $455,000 just for a specific reason here in a second. Okay, as you can see why probably. All right, and let's say, for example, in this division of assets, um, you're John Doe, so you're the petitioner. Let's say you're the petitioner in this matter and you want the house and you want all the equity and you're going to offset that equity by giving your spouse $370,000 from somewhere else. But if that's the case, if you're going to take the house and you want the house, we're going to put the entire $370,000 in your column. And we can put a zero in um, your spouse's column, in the respondent's column. Let's say you also own four, five, six um, Tall Street in um, Brea, California. All right. I'm going to say, yep. All right. And let's say you bought that a couple months later. Let's say you bought that in June of 2016. Let's say that one's worth 650000 and let's say you guys only owe uh, 280 on it. All right. Magically, that happens to be exactly 370. So I'm going to actually pick a different number. I'm going to say 250. You guys owe 250 on it. That leaves $400,000 worth of equity. And let's say this property is going to go to your spouse. So put zero in your column and 400,000 into their column. All right. Now, just, just real briefly, if we go to uh, the back of this form, excuse me, let's go to the second page of this form, and at the bottom, you can see that it is, on the very bottom, it says total assets. It's adding all of these numbers up for you. So, um, uh, that's why we use this form. It's a great form. For, for a couple different purposes. All right, so let's do a uh, property. Let's say uh, assorted, <clears throat> assorted personal property um, to wife. Um, 
don't really know when we acquired it. It's throughout the marriage. But let's say the gross fair market value. And by the way, for furniture or personal property, that's the value that you would get if you put it on the curb and sold it at a garage sale. So let's say that she's getting half of the or most of the furniture in the house um, and uh, that's valued at 1500 bucks. And again, she's getting it. So let's put zero in your column. Let's put 1500 bucks in her co your column. Or, excuse me, zero in your column, 1500 in hers because she's getting it. But let's then put assorted um, furniture to you. And let's say this one's worth 500 bucks because you're getting a lot less. And let's put that 500 in your column and zero in wife's column. Now let's go on to jewelry. Um, now this form's a little, a little interesting. So you need to understand about jewelry. If you gave your spouse a ring or a, um, you know, a necklace or you know, bracelets, whatever, bunch of different earrings, whatever you gave her, if it was a gift, you need to understand that's her separate property. So you're not going to list it on here as community property by the way going back up here so let's say we marked this community property that's not community property because that's her separate property it was a gift to her so it wouldn't technically go on here you could list it um, her jewelry and you could put separate property and then have nothing listed that would be fine so that you're not looking like you forgot it or, or neglecting it. You just, you know, it's her separate property, so you don't have to list a value. All right, vehicles. Let's say you own a 2015 Ford F-150. Most popular vehicle in the world. All right, so um, you put, uh, then you got it. Let's say you bought that in August of 2017. Let's say it's worth uh, $41,000. By the way, you can get a value of the vehicles using trade-in value on kellybluebook.com. Um, we use trade-in value at the courts most of the time because the courts, the judges know that you could drive that car, scoop it up, drive into CarMax or one of those types of dealers, and they'll write you a check on the spot. Um, you may not get full trade-in value, they're a little bit less, but but at least that's a number that we can work with. And if we do trade-in value on your car, and we also do trade-in value on the other party's car, theoretically they even out because it'd be you know the same relative difference in values if you both used you know private property sale on both. So, but we use trade-in value so that we're using a, a value that we know we can get tomorrow. And let's say you, just like most of us, let's say you uh, <clears throat> you owe uh, money on that car. Let's say you still owe $28,000. And let's say you're taking that truck and, and you want that truck. So you're getting that full $13,000 worth of equity. And then we're going to move on. And let's say there's a 2018 uh, Mercedes um s 550 that's an expensive car and you bought it uh let's say you bought that in um uh, let's say you bought that in may of 2018 and that vehicle was eighty two thousand dollars and you owe eighty three thousand dollars yes you can owe more now you bought that during your marriage the reason I'm bringing this up and let's say that your spouse is keeping that car notice I put negative a thousand dollars there if you bought this car together during the marriage the vehicle itself is a community property asset but the debt on the property is also a community property asset debt. So if it's a negative number and your spouse is taking that and she or he is promising to make all the payments and in this judgment it's given to that person, they're going to be responsible for that. So they get that 
negative number over there. All right, then let's say, for example, you go through each of these, by the way, let's say there's no savings accounts. It's rare, but there might be no savings accounts. Then let's go on to checking accounts. Now listen, there's other assets. There's a whole page here where you're going to go through cash, um, life insurance policies if they have a cash surrender value, stocks and bonds, mutual funds, retirement accounts, pensions, uh, IRAs, profit sharing. If you have any accounts receivables on a business you own, uh, you'll list that there. If you own a business, you need to put the value there. And if you have any other assets, you're going to list it down here under other assets. All right, so I wanted to get down here because I wanted to get an idea of what the difference in these values are, just for example purposes. 83, um, so the difference is 17,000. All right, so let me get back over here. Let's say, for example, you need to equalize because the courts have the duty to equally divide your property. If you want to divide your property any way you want, that's fine. You're allowed to do that, but that's going to require a judgment. You may have to say hello to the judge, have a hearing sooner or later to, to get over the questions the court might have. But if you're trying to submit a judgment without ever going to court, you're going to have to make sure that the assets and debts at the bottom of these uh, uh, this chart or whatever chart you use is even. The court only has the authority to divide your property 50-50. So, and property and debts. So let's say, for example, you have a checking account at Wells Fargo. And let's say um, that you had, you acquired this during the marriage. So we'll just put during the marriage here. And let's say today there's um, $37,000 in that account. All right. And uh, there's no loan against that money, so there's $37,000 in value. We know, because we already checked the bottom of this, so I'm going to try to make it even, that to make the division of assets um, equal, husband is going to need $17,000 more than wife. So if we divide this $37,000, by putting 27, giving $27,000 to the petitioner and $10,000 to the um, uh, respondent, I think that'll do it. Not the best at math. That's why I went to uh, law school instead of uh, accounting school. I am correct. It is now $410,500 each. So that's how we do this. And after you list all your assets on all of these pages, and all your debts, by the way, the next page is debts. And you list all the debts, credit cards, taxes, student loans. Um, then there's going to be a, title, a total down there. Now, between the assets and debts, you need to even it out if you don't want to go see a judge. And if you're going to submit a judgment without seeing a judge, without going to trial, anything like that, this is going to have to be even. So the way you do that is you find an asset where you can divide unevenly so that you can equalize the total assets in both columns. In this one, for example, we are using the Wells Fargo account ending in 46, uh, 4563, by the way. That's the last part of the account. You don't want to give the entire account number, um, but you want to list it so that we know what account it is. And, and you got to list all your accounts and all your cars and all your real estate and all your property. Um, but in the end, this is how you equalize it. Okay, folks, that is, uh, let, me, let me give you a little bit more on the, uh, on the debts because uh, I only did the property. But here, let's say there are um, student loans for uh, wife, wife's uh, lo student loans. And let's say that they were, um, okay, student loans are tricky. Um, and there is, um, and I will have a separate special video just on student loans. Um, so you should go listen to that video. Um, however, just real briefly, if the student loans were acquired before marriage, 
They're separate property. She needs to pay them or he needs to pay them on their own. If they were acquired during the marriage, but there has not been a sufficient period of time after the loans were accrued and, and or uh, have, have been uh, after the loans uh, were obtained and the income from that party has not increased so substantially that the community benefited by those school loans, by that education, then it will still be that party's separate property, even if it was acquired during the marriage. Student loans are tricky. Get some specific advice on that and go look, go look at my video then on student loans. That's a, that's a particularly, um, that's a, that's a particular asset or, or debt. Okay, folks. Then if you owe taxes, you're going to put your taxes in here, state, federal, whatever it is, and list the amounts. And you can put it under the column of who's going to take them. For example, if you have one party that makes $132,000 a year and the other one is a stay-at-home parent, you're not going to divide your, your debt equally because the other party's not going to be able to pay the debt and they're going to default, they're going to file bankruptcy, and all those debts are going to fall back on you anyway. So you want to be cognizant of that when you're dividing debt. Um, if there's any support arrearages um, from a previous relationship, likely, you're going to list those. If there's any unsecured loans, money that you borrowed from a family member or a friend um, that's not connected to any other kind of security, like credit card or... Um, car loan or anything like that then you're gonna list all your credit cards and these are both both of you this is stuff that you both own by the way or both owe uh, and then the bottom is the catch-all any other debts okay uh, and then on the back page there is some information and instructions if mine were not clear enough there are some more instructions on page four here all right folks I'm going to go back to the front of this page, the front of this form. Um, I hope this video has been helpful to help you figure out how to do a property declaration. Um, and uh, again, this can be used for several different things. So um, I wish you luck. I hope you've uh, enjoyed this video and see you on my other videos.